Hello, I'm David Eicholtz with David Richard Gallery, located in New York City, and I'm joined today by uh, Isaac Aiden. And uh, Isaac's an artist, also a curator, and uh, we're standing in a solo exhibition for Ed Showstack, um, also known as Rose Royale, and Isaac and I co-curated this uh, presentation. And what we'd like to do today is talk to you about uh, sort of this body of work, and as you're standing here, you can see it's quite an, an array of things, but this covers Ed's entire life. Um, it's not intended to be an all-encompassing or comprehensive uh, retrospective at all. What it's based on is as Isaac and I, and at first of all, I should just back up and say, Isaac knew Ed, um, he was a gay artist here in New York City, uh, emerged in the early 1960s, and um, Isaac knew him though later in life, and he was also transgender uh, as he had transitioned to uh, his alter ego and became the alter ego of Rose Royale. And so Isaac sort of knew him in the later years. And unfortunately, Ed passed away on April 8th of last year due to COVID-19. So uh, Isaac had, had told me about uh, Ed and we started looking through the archives and all the work and um, we both got very excited about the, the work and the body of work. And, and it's a very interesting story. And that's what we really want to unpack today for you is how we curated this show. And um, there were two themes that we came up with, and that's really what we want to focus on today. And that's why uh, the exhibition is titled Ed Showstack, Rose Royale, A Queer Perspective from Post-Minimalism to Social Practice, Selected Works from 1963 to 2020. Um, and the two themes that were curated this whole show around it, were actually pervasive throughout his entire career, regardless of how diverse the imagery <laughs> could possibly be. And that's, I think, the exciting thing about it. Um, nothing in Ed's life was an accident. <laughs> it was by design. And uh, sort of like Freddie Mercury, he really was exactly where he was meant to be in, later in life. And that's sort of the fascinating thing about him. So uh, that's where we want to st start off. But why don't you just give, since you know him on a very personal level, and you actually uh, worked with him in his studio uh, there towards the end, why don't you just give just a little bit of an oversight about Ed, just as a person, and, and then you know, we can kind of get into some of the details sure. of this particular work right here. Um, so my name's Isaac Aiden. I'm an artist and a curator. And it's a real uh, pleasure to help present this show because Ed was one of my best friends. And um, you know, I, I knew him uh, for a long time. Uh, he was a very, very special person. And beyond um, just the, the personal aspects of knowing him and uh, you know, everything that we shared, I really uh, admired his practice a lot. Um, he, you know, we talked a lot as artists, even though our practices was, were very divergent and very different. You know, he would say things to me and help push me like, I, there's something I'll never forget. I remember being in the ocean, swimming. He's like, he looked at some of my work and he's like, you got to get out in the deep water. He's like, it doesn't matter. And I was like, oh, but it's this. And he's like, no, no, no. Even if I think something, it's too similar. You really got to go out there. And so that's, that's how he was. He always knew the right thing to say. He was very gentle, but he would, he would push you. Sometimes he was a little prickly too. And as a, as a person, but you know, he was extremely special, special person and complex. And as an artist, you know, all of those things uh, got into his work. And um, what's really been exciting is this process with David is, is all this work, you know, very easily could have just been lost. You know, it's, it's, it's um, his early works are post minimalist sculpture. They don't look like paintings that you just hang on a wall. They very easily could have just been discarded. They were wrapped up in bubble wrap, probably hadn't been opened since the 70s or the 60s. And then there's all this other work. And so what we're going to try to introduce is, you know, as uh, you know, David and I looked at everything, we took my studio, we spread it out. We looked at it several times in the gallery, trying to think about the writing, what we were going to present, documenting and doing the registrar work. You really start seeing the connections. And, um, and you know, essentially, I don't, I don't go through all the details now, but he started out as a very formalist artist. You know, he was doing work, you know, in the, in the vein of primary structures. He's primarily a sculptor, yeah. and he does drawings, 
and then there's different aspects that kind of evolve into social practice which include film, video, photography, and performance art. And so originally he starts out very formally and then he starts um, kind of reducing, deconstructing, dealing with these different themes and, um, and then his work shifts. But if you look at it as a whole, and that's why we like to present this, this broader version, we want to present individual shows that look at each period uh, more closely and more formally. But if you see the breadth of his work, you do see these continualities throughout it. Yeah, and when Isaac first introduced him, and, and visually some of the work seemed familiar to me because um, he, as I said, was really you know, minimalist a sculptor. And he was one of the first people in the, uh, the first Whitney Biennial in 1972. I mean, he had an, an amazing career. He exhibited at Fishbach Gallery, um, uh, Castelli, um, then he was with uh, Holly Solomon for a number of years. So he had an incredible career, lots of museum exhibitions, um, I think at MoMA and I mean, mm -hmm. all sorts of places, yeah. internationally, got a Guggenheim Fellowship. at the Pompidou. So it was incredible. And then, it, and so when Isaac was showing me the work, it's, it was sort of head spinning. And then as we started breaking it down, we just literally, it was like a couple of days where we just sort of spread things out and just looked at it in total. And that's when it just dawned to me that this, these relationships just were profound and they were pervasive through everything. And so um, that's why we want to make it clear that this isn't a retrospective. And we are going to do other exhibitions. We're going to do a whole other one just on the formalist work because it deserves the, a, a lot of attention. There are none of the minimalist sculptures available per se. Uh, we may recreate a couple of them as, you know, for people to see some of the work. Um, he did sell a lot and a lot, um, you know, is in a lot of other collections. But, um, this, but he made a major transition in the 80s and, and that's when things seemed like they, he, and he became sort of less known and in fact, I would venture to say that much of the work that we're showing today, especially a lot of these drawings and studies and, and almost all the drawings and the videography, I don't think any of that has ever been, has ever been exhibited uh, in, in no. a gallery anywhere. And the other thing too is a lot of Ed's later work we want to point out to people is, um, was very much photo documentation of his transition. Mm -hmm. And also uh, this development of what we're coining as a social practice. Um, and we debated back and forth, is it relational aesthetics, is it social practice, you know, what is it? And we sort of settled on it and think it, it really is sort of more in the category of social practice. But the important thing though is um, what became, what we feel like we really want to convey here in this sort of survey look, and we will do a whole different show on his videos, tremendous number of, of, of films that he, and videos that he did and discussions with people in the trans community and lots of photo documentation. So we're going to do uh, several other shows that focus on some of these other things as well as the, the really incredible work that he did around AIDS activism and drawings and the, the sort of uh, gay side of his life and drawings. But they were, they're not just gay per se. It really shows how he really used the double entendre, how everything had a dual meaning, how everything was sort of where he just constantly was living in this tension between you know, sort of the real world and sort of his perception of what his ideal world would be or what he really got into being an artist for, which was to express himself. But as we all know, we all have constraints and limitations. And that's sort of the beauty of this work is how he was so um, always sort of undermining things and being subversive, but not in a negative way but in a way to create a code. It was like he was creating code and he was signaling to people who were sort of in the know. And, and that's the other thing that comes out of you know, this show. And that's why I guess we should just kind of get to why are we standing here in front of these pieces? Well, picking up on the, on the coding and um, you know, deliberateness is something that I picked up on from observing him as an artist. He was very deliberate and very dedicated. Like he had one drawing that he was working on literally since the 90s until about 2020 when he passed away. Well, many of them, even some of these we're gonna show you today, even though by most people's standards, they would be complete. That one uh, from the AIDS activism, it's sort of like his version of a quilt, but done as a drawing. And it's a large scale format drawing, very densely layered. And I would 
but it's clearly not done. We talked about this last night. It's about, it's about death and people of the yeah. his friends that they died. So then it's, you know, not so done until. So everything with him is so personal and everything is so, has a, the, the chronicling and documenting of everything is so important to him, although he never really expressed it as such, you know? Well, one, one thing uh, um, in the conversations at, you know, his wake, someone was talking about, oh, how he had stopped art and, and they snapped it. He goes, I never stop. I am always working. And, and he yeah. was. Sometimes he would work slower, but he, my point is that he was extremely dedicated to work on a drawing for all of those years and just continue and continue. And then all the documentation and source material. And so why we're standing here is... But one, just to clarify uh, one thing, though, but just to make sure people understand, when he talked about the reference Isaac made to with these long-term drawings, which we'll get into those in another, converse, in another exhibition because they're quite large, they're like scrolls and they're, they're huge and they're so dense and they, they just deserve so much singular attention. But I, I want to make sure that people understand though that Ed's practice wasn't just drawing and that's not what he considered art. I, I really think that Ed saw everything he did as art, the social practice, all the photo documentation, the wigs, the dresses, everything was an art form to him. And the thing is, is that what we sort of posit in this show is that mid 80s is when Ed started really transitioning to not only being the subject of his artwork, but he became the artwork and his life became the art and the social practice. That's why I also think when he was sort of defensive and make these comments, people say, oh, you quit doing art. And he, you know, you reference drawing. But I really do think the photo documentation, I mean, think like, you know, Martha Wilson, and, you know, and Cindy Sherman and people like this. I mean, all that documentation was by design. I mean, it was, it, it, he never formally presented it in any way. But there were thousands of photographs thousands. and he would hire camera people and have people over and take Stage pictures sets, of him. I mean, and incredible. It, it, very complicated to produce, you know, it yeah. wasn't just, you know, accidentally happening. But that's why I just want to make sure that we, we feel pretty confident that Ed felt that everything he did in his life, even the last video that he took <laughs> or, or, or photographed in 2020, before he died. And in fact, some of these drawings, he did make additions to these drawings that last week of his death. So it's, it's amazing how these things started back in the 80s and persisted all, during all this time. But, um, but anyway, just want to be sure that, that's, that the, show, the work in this show is not ephemera. A lot of the work that we're going to show you, it's not ephemera. It really, in his opinion, we genuinely feel was art. And, and it was incredibly creative. It may not be the way he had it in a pile, but as we started laying everything out and, and putting things in categories, we started realizing he was constantly curating. Mm. He was constantly composing. Everything was composed. And that's the other thing that we realized is that everything in his life was purposeful. Everything he did, uh, every, you wouldn't believe the detailed notes on everything, including, I don't think the sculpture's in the view, but this one is. But um, it, it, anyway, so we're, we're kind of going on and about the same thing. So we're going to get into the details, but that's why we got so excited was this just wasn't this diverse array of stuff. Yes, it's disparate, but in our argument is it's incredibly related and it's very telling. And, um, and it, we think it's very exciting. I mean, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. He was just very understated and he wasn't overly aggressive. As you said, he was very... Um, seemed very compassionate and very sensitive and very soft-spoken and what have you, but, um, but he was always thinking, always composing. And I think that was the, the well, amazing Well, sometimes thing. he was, you know, his personality was, you know, aggressive in a way, um, but... Um, yeah, you said he could be prickly. Yeah, he, he was a very complex person, yeah. you know, but um, he, he had a dedication and he wanted to do things the way that he wanted to do them on his own timetable, right. you know, and, you know, now we're, now we're presenting it. So how do we connect the dots between early sort of reductive sculptures? This isn't as, I mean, this isn't one of the reductive ones that would be like sort of a column to these things that are more like paisleys and floral and garden and, and, and garden sort of inspired to these sort of uh, quasi erotic drawings to, uh, trans, to drag and transgender. So two things that stood out to us. One is Everything is, or, is organic. Everything is inspired for him out of nature. He loved flowers, and, uh, and we'll kind of get into sort of more of the undercurrent of that. 
but he loved um, looking at flowers and leaves and, and fruit and, and paisleys and then breaking them down. And so that's a lot of these drawings are just lots and lots and lots of these drawings. And what's important about him is he would play with uh, taking a leaf and looking at a leaf, you know, and you, when you look at it, you can see that it's got um, dark and light, you know, shadows and, and there's glare and there's sort of, you know, sh shaded areas. And that's what gives it form and, and dimensionality. Well, rather than model, you know, coming out of his sort of minimalist uh, background, instead of modeling something, what he tried to do is break it down into just the simplest form that could be um, conveyed sort of flat and uh, or aggregated and and sort of convey something and so what he was trying to get at we think was really the essence you know sort of what is the essence of like you know you look at some of these uh, this swirl of leaves and what he was getting at was sort of that oval opening at the top and that motif shows up in a lot of other things including wigs and including sculptures you know the same thing with a lot of these leaves here that were sort of ripply he would pull out these little you know just aspects of them these little um, divots and elements and again they would show up again and it was pervasive in everything he did snail forms he loves snails mm -hmm. um, you know the these here he was these paisleys these sort of circular forms that kind of um, are floral like fruit like uh, these are clearly evocative of, or, or you know based on paisleys and uh, but then he would start layering them and um, and then what he would do what was sort of interesting is we saw later drawings where we could tell some of the later sculptures that we'll get to uh, later on were basically the voids so he would take these circular curvilinear forms and layer them and overlap them and then he would look at the spaces between and you can see him playing with it here these are um, wood and then a uh, screen and you put screening over it this is even more interesting because he's sort of um, created a scrim. These have been mm. sort of sprayed and brushed with paint. And so there's a little bit of an obfuscation. But as you can also see, there's a, a, this is a walk around sculpture, three dimensional sculpture, but you can see there's a whole other layer back here. And when you're looking through this screen, you're seeing part of that other you know, piece here. And so what ends up happening is, is he kept looking at these shapes and these voids. And, and then they actually became the element, the, the negative space of the voids between objects became his element. It became the, the icon or the motif then that he ended up using. And it's really apparent in some of the, the later sculptures that occurred in the late 70s and into the 80s. This also takes from nature because not only the forms, but the symmetry. So you see in nature, the symmetry. This piece looks um, almost like, like it could be like from Abex or something, the way it's composed. But what's very odd about it when we were photographing it and looking at it is that it's completely symmetrical, the two sides. But then it creates a whole other composition from each side because they're both painted different sides. The other thing is, you know, this piece, you know, has a lot of qualities formally of a painting or something like that because you almost see it in two dimension. But like David said, it is a three dimensional sculpture. You know, this is a fixed shot, but the screens create a moray pattern that, that kind of affects it optically when you walk around it. The other thing is that it's reductive, like the way that a, a, a piece of marble, a carving would be. He's working with planes and he's reducing it. That's how he's formally making it. And you look throughout his work, you see that, you know, that prospect of making sculpture by removing, by creating voids as something that's continuously present. Yeah, th that was a fascinating thing. And, you know, just not to digress too much, because we'll get into it and other things. That's not really a digression, but it's a, a whole other topic. But you almost wonder then, did Ed sort of see himself as a gay man in the 60s, you know, 50s, 60s, and early 70s, um, which was a challenging time. And um, even though there were a lot of gay artists and gay people in New York, but it's still, you know, you're still trying to work in, uh, within, uh, you know, heteronormative constructs of you know, culture in terms of how we're supposed to behave and what's right, wrong, and all that. And um, so I think it's sort of odd that he would, you know, 
then pick the voids, the, the, the space in between. And maybe he, he felt like he was a void, and that's why he, you know, he was part of this void. Um, he didn't really fit in with the pillars or the structures that we, we navigate through. And so, uh, it, it, and we're focusing on something that he did in the 70s. It was also kind of a, a movement away from the very blocky primary structures that we all thought of, you know, when you think of, you know, Donald Judd and, and, and what have you, and, and minimalist. Ed enjoyed that, that world, but as you can see, he digressed and kind of became more painterly. He had more of a story to tell, and it was a more personal story. It was a much more organic and biologically derived story. Mm -hmm. And so he, it's not a surprise he didn't stay confined to, um, you know, something that with the rigor of minimalism, where it's, you know, it's seriality, it doesn't have the artist's hand, it's, you know, it's, it's made by another and by instruction and things like that, that you, you can tell just by looking at most of Ed's life and, and work, that, that wasn't him yeah. personally. But it was very telling that's how he started. <laughs> and so um, the other thing too is it, we positioned this here because again, even though this drawing occurred later, you can see this sort of interesting how these things keep occurring. Mm -hmm. um, if you pull these two together, they, they sort of look like the, in this rendering here, this drawing, which is rather complex because it looks like a man, and it's torso, and it sort of is. But if you zoom in on it closer, you realize this is a pair. And these two forms here kind of look like two paisleys coming together, <laughs> like this over here. And so that's what we, our point is, is that, you know, this, these things just keep reoccurring. And it's not by accident. Um, these are shapes, forms, and elements that really motivated him. It came out of a tremendous amount of inspiration and influence in biology and understanding biology. Um, he loved like snails and you know aquatic animal and animals and uh, you know just uh, sort of the under the sea world, but also just flowers and plants, and they became sort of his vocabulary, but not directly and overtly through this reductive process by creating his own sort of elements that then he kept reincorporating. And well, that's a theme through today. So we'll as we move around this exhibition, you will see. Um, these elements popping up again in other things, whether it be sculptures, wigs, or um, other, you know, AIDS activist drawings.